Hi everyone, I'm Nikki Jovakik from Lookup Strata and for today's webinar session I'm joined by George Endicott and Bruce McKenzie from Sedgwick. Today we're talking about combustible cladding and defect remediation, specifically in Victoria. We draw your attention to the fact that the information in this session is applicable to Victorian legislation and viewers from other states would be best to seek relevant advice. George and Bruce will be talking about the risks of waiting to act and what owners and owners corporation managers need to do now to reduce risk and prevent issues from escalating. There will be a presentation on this topic and then we'll move into submitted questions. Before we begin, I'd like to mention that the information contained in this session, including the discussions that arise from submitted questions, is not legal advice and should not be relied upon as legal advice. You should seek independent advice before acting on the information contained in this session. Thanks to Bruce and George for joining us. Bruce has over 30 years experience in the building industry as a licensed building contractor and qualified supervisor on a wide variety of commercial projects. Bruce has been the recipient of multiple state building excellence awards and a national building award through Master Builders, the Peak Industry Association. Bruce is the current National Manager for Commercial Services and Major Projects, Building Consulting Division at Sedgwick. Bruce leads a commercial team of experts managing a wide variety of building projects nationally in the insurance and private sectors, including property damage, catastrophe and large scale remediation. This is Bruce's second Look Up Strata webinar. He joined us for a session on defect remediation last year, where he delivered content to our WA audience. George has over 20 years experience in sales and relationship management in the financial insurance and strata industries. He maintains a passion for supporting others' success by understanding clients' needs and their environment. His vision and strategic approach to business development and relationship management allows George to generate successful outcomes for clients and their stakeholders. This is achieved by putting clients first, seeking a thorough understanding of the situation and matching needs to Sedgwick's suite of professional building consultancy services, facilitating a trusted advisor environment for overcoming building related issues. More recently, George has focused on supporting clients with combustible cladding remediation solutions. Sedgwick frequently appears in our monthly Strata magazines, webinar sessions, and regularly contributes to questions about building defects, scope of works, mold and water damage received from the Look Up Strata audience. We'd like to welcome both Bruce and George this morning. Thanks so much for your time. And I believe that George is starting the discussion this morning. Thank you, Nikki, and good morning, everyone, to, uh, to the podcast. Uh, Bruce and I are excited about uh, the opportunity to uh, speak with you today and uh, hopefully address uh, as many questions as, uh, and queries as we can today. Um, I guess before we get into the more technical um, aspects of, uh, of what uh, Bruce will address uh, to those questions today, I um, really wanted to try and set the scene for today's podcast and, and our role in defect remediation uh, activities in class two buildings or, or strata buildings for that matter. Um, so Sedgwick, a bit of background here, Sedgwick are a global risk management provider. Um, we undertake building consultancy and project management uh, activities in class two multi-residential buildings uh, throughout Australia. And so we act on behalf of clients, uh, those clients being a, a, a range of clients in terms of uh, insurers, uh, government, uh, legal, uh, as well, of course, as, uh, as our private corporations, including the, uh, the strata industry. So we act on the client side of building related matters. And to ensure clarity, I guess, in terms of our role and, and, and reflecting on the answers that we're providing today to your questions and queries, uh, we're, we're not principal contractors or builders. Uh, we're not the developer or, or the certifier or fire engineer or insurers for that matter. So um, our role, uh, contractually speaking, is what's called the, the, the superintendent. So we act as that uh, impartial uh, stakeholder to ensure that we get the smooth um, operation of, uh, of that building contract uh, for, the, for the project at hand. Uh, we've had first-hand experience of doing that uh, throughout Victoria through the, uh, the Cladding Safety Victoria uh, cladding program uh, in other states as well, and also uh, for other projects that involve defect remediation, but not necessarily uh, cladding. Uh, we do have, a, 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 however, and uh, Nikki uh, alluded to this, we do have a suite of uh, building consultants who are highly experienced uh, technical experts 
uh, that we rely on to support us in terms of our remediation activity on behalf of clients. So um, before I hand over to Bruce, I guess really the, the key messages I wanted to be able to convey is that um, our role and our experience, particularly in cladding, but across a lot of defects uh, through, throughout Strata, um, has allowed us uh, as a project manager to better appreciate the complexities around defect remediation, uh, the fact that you often need a, a, a holistic uh, approach to the challenges that are faced by lot owners and strata managers um, alike in terms of coming to, to a response, because ideally, uh, whilst we've got an issue at hand, uh, we don't want that repeated. We want to try and prevent that from happening uh, in the future to get that building to, uh, to standard and to the state that it was before that defect. Um, interestingly too, cladding, um, whilst often it's talked about uh, separately and, and for obvious reasons, given the, the issues around life, state, life safety, um, is that it is one of several, uh, what we call serious defects. Um, and that's what, certainly what uh, it's labeled in New South Wales. Um, and cladding effectively makes up one of five rough uh, cladding uh, groups. Um, interestingly, it's the, uh, the water ingress uh, group of defects that uh, probably causes a, a lot, if not uh, a lot of the pain faced by lot owners and strata managers alike. And that's what we're grappling with. So certainly cladding is, is the priority in terms of life safety. Um, but out of observation and statistically, uh, it's water ingress issues that uh, pose the, the biggest challenges to us. Um, that's not to mention um, you know, fire safety issues, um, uh, key services, so things like mechanical and lifts and so forth, as well as structural issues. Now, um, sometimes those structural issues can be um, uh, isolated, but can be significant to, to the building. So that's certainly something that we need to take uh, into account. Um, so at the end of the day, really the priority around looking at these defects is in terms of taking action, it's really around that prism of life safety um, and everything goes off that. Um, the other aspect, of course, um, is then really the, the duty of care that stakeholders have in terms of uh, mitigating further risk uh, and, and preventing further damage to, to the building, which obviously equates to, therefore, where possible, um, saving, uh, saving dollars. Um, and so really before um, uh, uh, handing over to, to Bruce and, and summarizing, um, what can be done? Well, I think firstly, um, it's, it's taking action, um, being uh, aware of the problem and doing something about it, um, being objective uh, when dealing with the issues. Um, we do appreciate and empathize with, with lot owners and strata managers for that matter, um, the emotional toll that um, defects uh, can take uh, on, on class two buildings. Um, the other aspect then, and it's an obvious one, but that is get professional help. Um, you know, use your strata manager, your facilities manager to ensure that you get um, the right resources to, to address that problem. Um, and, and finally, um, as we said, is, is take that action, be decisive, uh, plan for it in terms of your budget, uh, about the problems at hand uh, and what's involved. And um, that's really the, the segue to, to Bruce now in terms of how then we grapple with these uh, issues, uh, and both on a technical side and a holistic side. So Bruce, I might hand over to you now um, just to continue that conversation and then we'll delve into uh, the questions that have been uh, addressed to us. Thanks, George. Um, and good morning, everybody. Um, thank you, Nikki, as well. Um, I'm just going to um, quickly introduce myself and then, then we'll get into some um, detail. I don't have a, um, a slideshow today to, to put up on the screen. I thought a lot of these points are probably better spoken through. Um, like many people, we've been through a um, number of slideshows and things. And I think we're, we're at a point um, when we talk about cladding and defects where we are certainly at the action stage now. We've all seen plenty of detail on, on the, um, you know, the intricacies of, of what cladding's about and that sort of thing. So I won't go into that today. Um, my experience um, many years ago, particularly in Victoria, um, we had a, uh, a fire in a building that um, through our insurance arm of the business that we got involved with as we normally do, where we respond to that building and we, we normally write a scope of work to, to rectify that building, um, which is part of the way insurance works. Um, that particular building back in 2014 was La Crosse and naturally writing a scope of work to fix that building was extremely complicated because of 
cladding problems. And my involvement in cladding started there and I've stayed close to it ever since um, and, and been involved in many, many cladding projects um, from a remediation point of view. As George pointed out, we're not builders, we're not developers. We've never um, had a hand in a, in a project um, per se. It's more on the, the rectification side of things. So I picked up a lot of things along the way and where we're at at the moment um, today is we're quite involved with Cladding Safety Victoria um, on the remediation scheme. We have been for a couple of years now. Um, we've got about um, 20 uh, odd buildings on foot, um, a lot of which are complete now. Um, and what we're getting now is a lot of interest from the industry in Victoria on buildings that didn't necessarily um, qualify for the cladding scheme, um, but still need rectification because they've got orders in place. Um, I'm sure there's plenty of people on the call today that may be in that situation. And I guess that was what we wanted to talk about just, just a little more. Um, so where we're at at the moment, um, those particular buildings um, by nature have a, a different degree of risk and a different degree of cladding than what the buildings did that made uh, or qualified for the scheme is probably a better word. Um, to qualify for the Cladding Safety Victoria scheme, there's lots of criteria. Um, a lot of that is to do with the, the um, ultimate risk, fire risk of um, the extent of cladding on the building. Um, a lot of buildings do have um, the worst ones I've seen at, at what I would call 100% um, cladding on all elevations. So that's top to bottom on all four sides. Not a lot that have that, but there are some. They're obviously classified as the most extreme risk. Um, and then it comes down from there, it reduces to just a few elevations or, of course, um, features on buildings. And that's the, the distinctive fins and um, architectural features that you see in a lot of buildings these days. That uh, seems to be a, a common area where, um, you know, aluminium composite panel is used on, on those features. Um, and then as we get down into the lower rise buildings, um, what I mean by that is, you know, three, four storey buildings, uh, we start to see a, a fair bit of the expanded polystyrene or EPS, uh, again, a banned product um, on those um, multi-storey buildings, hence it becomes an issue and, and needs removal. So um, in the buildings we've had involvement with in Victoria, um, I would have to say probably um, almost um, maybe a little bit more EPS product we've dealt with rather than aluminium composite panel. Um, but having said that, there's some buildings we're starting at the moment that are bigger, um, that do have a, a, a larger degree of that aluminium composite panel. So we're sort of diving into that as well. Um, and I know um, there's another question that's come through and um, we will come to that a bit later. There was a question raised on a, um, another uh, polystyrene composite panel, which has mm. cement mixed through it. Um, known as QT. It's got a few other names as well. Um, I've got a bit of information on that, but I'll address that when we come to that question. So um, really um, getting into the, I guess, the, the theme of today, I, I, it was in two parts, um, the way that we put together the, uh, I guess, the questions you could call it. Um, one was what are the risks of waiting to act and what do owners and owners, corporation managers need to do next to reduce the risk and prevent issues escalating further? Uh, and the second part was when remediation work occurs, what can we expect and what assurance do we have things were done properly the second time around? Um, now that part two is something I'm um, very passionate about and um, certainly have a fair bit to say on that, way more than what we've got time for today. Um, but addressing part one, um, what are the risks of waiting to act? I think most of us are aware of those risks at the moment, but um, what is sort of coming down heavy on at the moment in the industry, I think is, uh, building orders starting to become enforced by various um, councils throughout um, the Victoria area. Um, and I think, um, to put it bluntly, I think the patience is starting to wear thin with some of those, um, those councils where they want action on some of those orders. When I say action, uh, sometimes that action can simply just be a response and confirmation of engagement of an expert or something like that. Other times it could be um, they want physical action done as in something needs to be removed or the, the risk mitigated in some degree. The important um, part of that is you need to take some action. And even if that's just engaging an expert, the worst strategy I've seen, and I have seen this quite a few times, unfortunately, is ignoring the order or not, um, not, not responding in some manner to, to give assurance to that regulated that you are um, you know making some attempts to, to address the issue so um, the primary um, I guess consideration is safety first and foremost um, irrespective of the order um, is the safety at risk of the occupants of the building and if it is 
um, what ramifications could come of you if you are part of a, an OCM or a, um, in the executive committee or even an owner? Um, is there any, um, I guess, comeback on you by not acting and knowing that there is a safety problem in that building? So that's probably the primary concern. The second concern um, I often raise is um, obviously the, the, the continuation of damage to that property. So um, putting my uh, insurance cap on for a minute because we work across the insurance industry as well as the, the project management industry. Um, insurers quite often look at the fact, um, was the damage mitigated in any way possible? So it didn't double or triple in cost at the end of the day because everyone sat around and watched it and hoped that something would, it would just go away. So it is important, um, particularly on buildings, if you are considering the potential of recovery of funds to pay for that, if it's against the developer, the builder, um, insurance, if that was possible, often it's not, but if that was a consideration, it really is important just to demonstrate along the way that you've done what you could to mitigate further damage. So, <coughs> excuse me, um, as George pointed out before, water leaks are a big issue at the moment. So quite often temporary fixes to water leaks are, are something that can be done uh, in the interim prior to it escalating into a bigger problem. I would encourage everybody to consider those. Um, and just make sure that you are, um, you have, um, I guess, a history or a, a file path, I'll call it, of, of information there that you can prove later on that you did what you could um, as a stakeholder in that process to try and um, prevent things from getting worse um, down the track. That's fairly important. Um, the other problem in the industry at the moment and um, being very actively involved in, in construction projects at the moment throughout Melbourne, um, is the increase in cost. Um, so we've seen a, a significant increase in cost in labour um, and materials, um, more than I've seen in my career in the building industry. It's um, This period of time has been extraordinary. I think we all know the reasons behind that from COVID to, to even material supplies out of um, international companies um, uh, where they manufacture goods. Um, I know even some of the replacement cladding and things like that comes out of China and countries like that where we have tensions and problems. So all in all, um, there's pressures on material supply that has a knock on effect, which in impacts the cost. So a, a very regular question that, that is asked of me is, um, here's my building, this is the problems we have. How much do you think it would cost us to, to remedy this building if the worst happened and we had to replace all the cladding as, a, and as an example? Um, that question is becoming increasingly difficult to answer now because of that spike in costs in labour. So um, really, um, again, it's important. Um, I think that's not going to probably come back down again. That probably will sit up in that higher bracket. I don't think I've ever seen cost increases in my career where they've come back down again or, or very rarely. So I think, again, um, it is important to sort of take some action sooner rather than later so that we can just mitigate costs overall. I guess an uptick to that is um, we've all seen property values increase significantly throughout Australia in different areas. So, um, you know, on that basis, um, the equity in that that um, unit or property is, is, you know, there's some encouragement there, um, but I certainly would encourage people to act. So um, that just covers a few risks. Um, there's obviously some other risks there, but that's broadly um, what we see. And um, time is the other one. It, it's not on everybody's side quite often. And quite often as a, a provider of these services, we get approached by different um, organisations to, to assist in coming up with a solution. And our hands are tied a little bit if that time frame is, is squashed down to a small period before you need to take action on an order or something. Uh, it does really limit the amount of um, assistance we can give you and the support. Um, often our engagement um, requires a bit of investigational work to be done where we have to go and, and find information out and come back. And, and if we lose that ability, often our um, ability to, to provide the best solution to an owner's corporation is diminished a little bit. So certainly early warning, if you engage us or any other expert, doesn't matter who it is, um, just try and be considerate of that time because it does make a difference in, in potentially trying to mitigate costs. Um, talking about now part two, which was this um, remediation, um, when it occurs, um, what can we expect and what assurance do we have that things will be done properly the second time around? So um, in, in that aspect, absolutely everybody knows um, there's a nervousness about this second round, which is I call second round, it's fixing your building, it's, it's having 
another builder come in. Um, occasionally, we sometimes see the original builder come in, but a lot of the time it might be a new builder come in. Um, they're going to do remedial work and you have a very nervous bunch of owners who are uh, often contributing to the cost and they want to know, how do we know we won't end up in the same situation a second time around? So a few points I've noted on that. Um, and again, it's something I'm quite passionate about because the frustration of the industry as to where it is today um, is, is certainly on the back of my mind all the time because my background is building and I've come across the client side now, but quite often I look at situations and think, why would a builder have ever done that in the first place? It, it's beyond me, um, but it occurs. And certainly um, I'll extend some sympathy out here to a lot of good builders out there. There's plenty of them. So don't be nervous. If they, they can't be found. They can be found. Um, but there is a minority that are tarnishing the industry and they're the ones we need to be vigilant about and make sure that the, their um, work practices don't continue on in the industry, which is part of something we're trying hard to, to, um, to address. So certainly um, when, when this second round occurs, um, some notes I've made just on what are some of the things we can do to make sure it happens properly the second time round. A scope of work, and, and that's a broad statement, scope of work. Some people might look at that and think, you know, two sentences on a, on a um, you know, a, a email might be enough to be clear instruction for a builder or a contractor to get on, to get on with the work. Um, definitely not. Um, you need to be as explicit as you possibly can on what you need done to remedy that problem. Um, when we talk about defects in buildings, nine times out of 10, that is usually off the back of an expert report or expert findings or something that's come out um, that needs to be explored further. Um, so the first stage would be engaging proper experts to develop that scope of work. And that often may be a, a culmination of, of various experts that get together. It could be, um, you know, from a um, hydraulic side of things, if it's water problems, it could be electrical, it could be facade, fire. Um, a lot of those experts will be, will be pulled together and then a scope of work will be prepared um, to, to be very explicit in what it is that needs to occur from that point forward. Um, the second note I've got is proper contracts. So what essentially you're saying is that before you even look at getting a contractor involved, you want to prepare a contract that is rock solid and that, that enforces that that scope is going to be done properly so that you've got some confidence. Um, the next one um, beyond that I've written is record and capture of details. So as the contract gets on foot and it starts, you sign up and you get underway, what assurance do you have that, that um, the scope, and I'll call it the promise, is the promise being fulfilled? So what you want is that actually being done. Um, and quite often, you know, a, a, a remedial builder will um, in all good conscience go ahead and do those things. Um, but certainly having another expert involved at that stage to oversee on behalf of the owners to make sure that they're getting what they paid for is a really essential thing to have along the way. Um, without that, um, unfortunately, there's no guarantees whether things are done properly. So you really need some assurance there. Um, holding the contractor accountable to that scope. So that's part of that process, which is just making sure, you know, for argument's sake, if you asked for a um, you know, a Rolls-Royce membrane to go down on the balconies this time around because you want assurance. Are you actually getting that? Do you know that? So it's getting those checks along the way so that you, you've got some assurance. Um, the site management supervision is, is one I often talk about a lot and a lot of builders, um, you know, or, or often I've seen builders provide site managers that sometimes are not in attendance all the time, or they're not supervising the work properly. So it is, um, it's a, what it is a result of is pressures on the industry, you know, costs, um, the, the cost drivers often force um, sometimes builders into situations where they may perhaps don't allow for the, the, the sort of supervision that a job may need. And that's just a reflection of the industry. But it is really important, particularly when we do tender assessments, um, we look into what the builder is going to provide so that we know that the adequate supervision is going to be there. And that supervision is what oversees the trades um, to make sure that the components are installed properly. It's crucial. I can't emphasize enough how crucial that role is because that determines the success or the failure of your building ultimately at the end of the day, if something's not put on right. Um, we've seen examples in cladding of, of, you know, 
parts behind the wall, such as the sarking or the battening or, or insulation going on wrong. Um, and we've managed to pick that up and correct that along the way. And those things would have got through had there not been some form of a, um, you know, an expert there along the way, making sure that that gets done properly. So it's just a safety net to, to, um, to make sure that happens. Um, and then finally, um, proper certification certificates, warranties. I think a lot of people that are, that are sitting in buildings today and that have current issues with uh, membranes on balconies, I keep saying that one, it's just such a, a popular one. Um, you know, any other types of water ingress issues, cladding, of course, there's lots and lots of those um, issues getting around. Um, but a lot of those issues, I think one of the first things people go to is, do, do, do we actually have a warranty for that particular thing? Or what's our recourse on the builder? Or how do we get some sort of recovery so we don't have to pay it ourselves? So when you go the second time around, the importance of getting those warranties and those certifications and certificates in place is more important than ever because that is going to be your recourse down the track if something ever did, God forbid, if something went wrong again second time round, you, you want to be really, really certain that you've got the right um, leverage this time to be able to sort of recover if, if there was a problem. Um, so that, that's, um, that's probably the emphasis I could hand over. And then um, the completion of the project, final inspections prior to payments, things like that, again, getting experts involved at that stage too, because your leverage is obviously in the payments. Um, so when you are paying contractors, when they're remediating, um, it's important that you can check prior to um, making that final payment. So there's a, a, a assurance amongst all that you've got what you paid for. That's, that's a critical component of it. So that sort of covers off on those two parts um, of, of where things have been happening. Again, if I go back and reflect on what's happening in the industry at the minute in Victoria. It is quite a fair bit of activity at the moment on buildings that um, have um, some form of cladding on it that, that is non-compliant, that needs um, some sort of addressing. Um, but what I would put it down to is probably more of a less significant nature. So it might not be a high volume of material. It could be material that's questionable. Uh, it could be, um, you know, just in a, in a certain area or in an area that might not be considered at risk. So um, what that does, it, it actually opens up probably more questions about that um, for owners and even for managers like us when we start to get involved as opposed to a building that has um, aluminium composite panels smothered on four sides, those buildings are kind of um, a lot simpler to manage because it's just replacement and get on with it. So we are getting into a complex area now and there are considerations that need to be made. Um, but the most important thing at the moment, I think is to start taking action now because there's going to be a very big flurry of these projects getting on foot um, over the next six to 12 months. And I don't think I'd like to be sitting at the back of that queue um, for a number of reasons, um, most of which probably is just simply getting contractors engaged to do the work, because I think that's where you're going to be in a vulnerable position if, if something doesn't happen sooner rather than later. So um, I'll, I'll just pause at that minute, um, uh, Nikki, and I'm, I'm not sure if we wanted to jump into a couple of questions. Okay, that's, um, yeah, that's great. Thanks so much, Bruce, for that information and George as well. Um, so what we might do now, we did have a few questions, as you've mentioned, that were submitted to us. And then I've noticed that there's quite a few questions that have come through during chat. So I've just made a note of those. So hopefully we'll get to those. Thank you to everyone who, who has jumped in there and submitted a question. Um, but we'll jump to the ones that we had that were sent in. So the first one isn't a cladding. Um, it's more to do with uh, water damage, which you've mentioned as well. Uh, so this one came in from Sula and it was, um, I live in a two-storey townhouse in a block of eight. The block is about 15 years old. I have a street level sliding door opening into onto a 25 square metre balcony. I was told by tradesmen that due to the building defect, my balcony sits higher than it should. The sliding door tracks are buried into the balcony, so rainwater cannot drain out of the tracks and instead flows onto my garage below. The OC will not help as they say it's not their problem. I've requested approval to protect the door from rainwater by installing an awning, but OC will not approve the change in appearance of the lot. Bruce, um, yeah, we, we, we've seen uh, we've seen some of these before, and. and Funny enough, um, this is, there's a design element to this. So what Sula I think is de describing there is um, 
the fact that you've got this uh, flush um, system uh, between two two floors and the the, the sliding door mechanism, um, and normally there is a, a, a drainage system that is attached to to that design. Um, Bruce, maybe we explain a little bit more about um, how yes. that's supposed to work, and then looking at what can be done. Yeah, yeah, sure. So um, essentially, um, in accordance with the building code, and I know. Um, in a lot of situations, it's probably a bit late for that, but there should be a step between the inside and the outside. To just put it very simply, there should be a step down between the inside and the outside. Under different circumstances, that step can vary, but we're talking around about 75 millimetre or three inches. Um, and again, that can change dependent on the exposure of the particular um, building, whether it's, um, you know, um, uh, what type of building and what exposure to the, the coast and those sort of things. So um, that step um, very regularly is compromised. And I think we all know modern architecture has got a big part to play in that um, because I think for most of us, we all enjoy that indoor outdoor living uh, transition where we walk through, we don't want to step over something or down. We like to just sort of go straight through. Um, how have they overcome that in modern architecture? What they've done, uh, one of the solutions is, is strip drains that they, they put at that, um, that opening. And effectively the step is, is within that um, strip drain where there's an ability to capture the water um, before it can come inside, um, which, which is an alternate to a step, if you like. So the purpose of a step is that um, if you looked at, say, an outdoor balcony, if it's a 75 millimetre step, the balcony can effectively fill up like a bathtub, if you like, and it's not until it reaches that 75 millimetre height that it will spill inside. So that's your layer of protection. And you would like to think by then that the water's overflowed off the balcony and gone and you don't have a problem. To address a problem like this, and I have to say, this is very, very common. Uh, we see this regularly. Um, Sue, so you mentioned your building is 15 years old. Um, quite often, you know, around about that era, there, there um, was a lot of buildings that started to sort of um, alleviate that step. And sometimes the other thing that can happen in a building that, of, of that age is over time, people make decisions to renovate and they may choose to put tiles or something on that balcony where they'll put a bedding down and they'll put the tiles down. It gets built up and all of a sudden it's over the, um, it, it eliminates that step. So the drainage that George spoke about um, is normally in the aluminium sill um, and there's drain slots that when the water hits the glass and it runs down into the track at the bottom, there's slits that, that allow the water to escape back out again and spill onto the balcony and, and uh, run away. If you cover those slits up, it's like putting a plug in a bathtub, basically. The water can't get out. Um, and what happens is normally that water will build up and the, the closest place it can go is normally in and it'll run in um, because it's only form of escape. So when those slots are blocked, um, you are limited in what you can do. And, and a couple of solutions, sometimes not ideal, but certainly looking at your balcony and whether there are retrofitted tiles or something on the, the balcony that perhaps may need to come up and, and um, be, be lowered to a, a new height, if that's possible. Um, another alternate solution we have done before is um, had contractors cut strip drains in um, that have allowed that escape of water, but that's very, very dependent on the, the structure below, such as the concrete slab and things like that, where we can't just go cutting into structural members of a slab. We've got to have that considered as well. So it can be complicated. Um, it is normally associated with a lot property um, problem, given it's a balcony and a sliding door. So that, that is problematic. Um, so it'd be interesting on that particular building to know if other units in the complex have that same issue um, or right. whether it's common to your unit and whether it may have been something that was retrofitted to that balcony that, that created the problem. Okay, thanks, Bruce. That was great. Um, all right, we might jump back to the planning, planning question that we had submitted as well. Uh, so this one is from Bruce. Um, in 2020, a building order was placed on our building by the Victorian Building Authority because of the suspected issues with the cladding. Subsequent CSIRO testing of the cladding concluded that the product used on our building, described as Conpolcrete, is of a lower combustibility risk than, say, high-risk aluminium composite panels, 
and expanded polystyrene products. After long discussions with the VBA and Cladding Safety Victoria, the OC is yet to get clarification on whether our cladding requires removal. Can you please offer an opinion on what Conpol Creek could be deemed as compliant by the VBA with the recent amended provisions of the Building Act 2021? Thanks, Nikki. Um, okay, so Conpol Crete. Um, so this particular product, for those who are not aware, um, is actually a, um, a recycled polystyrene, um, but it's not to be confused with expanded polystyrene, which is 100% polystyrene and, and extremely combustible. This particular product is a mixture of um, polystyrene, but it's also mixed with cement and binders. Um, and it was marketed um, as a, a non-combustible product, an, a, a good recyclable product, and an alternate to just expanded polystyrene. Uh, it's a panel form. Uh, it, it then lends itself to, to coatings and rendering, et cetera. So uh, again, we've seen this product on a lot of buildings. Um, I can't really probably say a lot on um, the detail of this, but what I can say is we've um, uh, been involved with the VBA on this. And there is um, some exploratory work going on at the moment with CSIRO on considering the nature of it and uh, a response, a, a more direct response from the VBA is imminent at the moment. So it is coming um, and it's being worked on at the moment. Um, the, the nature of this particular product um, is probably a little bit harder than say an aluminium composite panel to determine how uh, volatile the actual product is because most of these products vary quite a bit from extreme scale down to low scale depending on the makeup of the product. Um, I know for a fact with this one um, we've come across different cores, pink, white, grey cores um, on one project in particular where we know we're trying to get to the bottom at the moment of why the cores are different and whether that is um, a difference in weight and mass and that weight and mass in that product determines its combustibility level. So if it's a heavier panel with more cement, it's probably likely to be less combustible, whereas if it's lighter, it's got more polystyrene, it's more combustible. So that's the direction it's going at the moment. And as I said, it's, it's likely that the decision is going to be imminent from the VBA on what their stance is going to be on um, this product. It's also referred to as QT for those, um, or, or that's how it's been referred to um, in the industry we're working in at the moment, it's exactly the same product. And um, I can assure you it is front of mind at the moment with the VBA, they're working on um, how they're going to respond to that. And um, I, I guess something might be forthcoming very shortly on that, which might give a little bit of more direction on your building as to where that can go. Okay, so the best action there would be just to wait and watch for a short period of time until um, something else comes out. Will they be notified? Yeah. Will a notification be sent through? Or um, I, I couldn't be sure, but um, I, I would, yeah, I don't like suggesting waiting on any of these buildings, but certainly with this product, yes, I think I, I would be giving advice to say um, that something will be coming out imminently. Um, I can't say too much more on it, but... Um, it is being worked on at the moment. And as I said, it's front of mind. Um, VBA are aware they're not treating um, this product as EPS that is totally combustible and, and should be removed. They are considering it. Um, so that's a good sign um, for anyone who does have QT. There's hope there, I guess, is what I'm saying. And I, I would certainly be waiting just in the short term. Um, and then hopefully something, I'm not sure the method or how, the VBA may um, communicate their findings on that, but um, when it happens, certainly we'll be across it. Um, we're very close to it at the moment, so we'll be across it straight away, and then we may be able to get adv advice to any owners, including Bruce, in this situation on um, where, where to go from there. Okay, thanks, Bruce. Maybe if um, people can keep an eye out on our newsletters as well, you can let us know if any information comes through and we can certainly um, put that out in one of our bulletins to let people know that the, their, their findings have come through. Um, sure. Okay, so we might just jump into the questions that have been submitted during the chat. So I've, I've copied some of these down for us. Uh, so one of them that I thought... Um, it would be great if you could speak on and we did cover this I know you've mentioned scope of works and the importance of a really clear scope of works we did a session um, I recorded a session with a, a different team from Sedgwick a couple of weeks ago that went into scope of works in quite detail so we might link to that as well in the the email that we send out later today so people can take a look at that um, but Lazarus has asked does Sedgwick provide strata managers templated scope of works or support or documents to ensure the insurers are put at ease 
Yeah, look, we, um, I guess as a business, um, how we um, prepare our scopes of work are relatively typical. Most of them are, um, are similar in the layout that they're done. Um, and what, what we're doing is providing, I guess, explicit advice to a contractor on what we want them to do right from, um, I guess, um, every stage of the work. And certainly, if we talk about cladding and most defects, um, when we look at the, the problem of cladding or the particular defect, I can assure you, when you write a scope of work, it's not a matter of just removing that thing and replacing it. There's always subsequent work that happened. Um, and so part of what we try to do is to um, unpack all of that work. Um, if it is, you know, in a unit where we may end up having to strip plasterboard off, ultimately that would, you know, might mean carpet replacement too. It might mean, you know, fixing the gardens outside because the scaffold's going to damage it. it, it it's all of those knock-on things that we try to make sure the builder includes. And the benefit of that is to try and alleviate um, surprise costs and variations later on where, owners certainly don't appreciate, um, a, you know, a builder or anybody, us for that matter, turning around saying, it looks like we've got another $50,000 worth of cost because we didn't realise that, um, you know, we, we had to cut up a section of driveway to do what we did. So part of what we do is um, take a fairly deep dive, I guess, into the whole methodology of how is this going to actually occur. Um, and also we look into things when we start to consider contractors such as how are they going to gain access to that side of the building? And are they expecting to, to um, completely block the driveway and access so no one can park for three months? Or um, what considerations have they made? And, and because we work with live buildings all the time, we, we know the questions to ask and we, we already know what's acceptable and not acceptable to most owners corporations. So we will, um, we will dive into that deeply and make sure that um, a builder is realistic in the way they're going to approach it to mitigate um, or reduce the impact to the, the occupants, um, particularly when they're going to occupy the building. So that's part of the, um, the service we provide. Um, probably more directly to the question, yes, that the layout is, is a fairly um, standardised layout. Most of the insurers have all seen it before. Yep. Um, and that often goes to insurance builders as well. Um, if it's another kind of loss that we're involved with, floods is probably a really big one at the moment. So, yeah. yeah. I just just on that, I think um, what's really important, and, and Nikki, I'm sure this was probably addressed in the previous uh, podcast regarding scopes of works, is that it is a very important um, document. It, it effectively provides that conduit of communi written communication between, um, yeah, you know, the 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 principal contract or who's going to undertake that work, and who's providing uh, or where that instruction has come from. Um, that's that line of communication, um, which is needs to be very clear. Uh, and if there's any dispute, you've got that um, that source of truth to go back to. Um, so that's why it's important to Bruce's comments about doing that uh, investigation, putting all that information in up front. So by the time you have a signed off scope of works, um, everyone is on the same wavelength. Everyone knows what the expectation is. And you can use that then as your conduit for um, proceeding. Um, so, yeah, I can't emphasise enough that the scope of work is, uh, is an integral document in the whole process. Um, obviously, as project managers, we would use that then as a cornerstone for um, how we will then um, support uh, on behalf of clients the, the, the program delivery of, uh, of that uh, project. Wonderful. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for clarifying that. Uh, okay, we'll go back to another question. Uh, this one was from Loralee. Um, how can I know the risk level of my building if it is a high rise um, of 65 levels and if if the uh, points to make uh, or what are the financial what are the points to make um, to a candidate to get financial support? Okay, is, is that risk in the context of, uh, of, of cladding or risk as in um, safety issues? I'm not quite sure what what risks are we talking about there? Uh, maybe, Laurel, if you can jump in. Yes, cladding. She said, yeah, it is cladding. So, Bruce, maybe maybe we can just um, discuss, I guess, going back um, the how the, uh, I guess, the preliminary stages for assessing buildings um, took place in terms of assessing that risk and perhaps that we can address that issue with Laurel. Yeah, look, I'd, I'd expect a building of that size. Um, there's been some form of a risk assessment done already. Um, 
um, without sort of being privy to that information and the volume of the cladding, it's a hard one to answer, but certainly, um, you know, on buildings of that scale, quite often the most um, common areas we see the, the ACP cladding in particular is returning into balconies and, and feature strips and things like that. So um, those um, in early stages, it was considered that perhaps that wasn't as risky as say having a building that's got cladding, um, you know, over all four elevations, but it's certainly been proven and even particularly with the lacrosse fire that um, having that cladding on balconies in particular is extremely dangerous. Um, and particularly when you've got, um, you know, contents on balconies that can be combustible. So um, on that note, yeah, it's, it's probably hard to determine what the full risk is, but I would suspect um, that building may have an order on it already. And if it did, that's something that we'd be happy to just have a look at and might answer the question a, bit, a little bit clearer on, um, you know, where potentially that may go and what are the, the means of recovery for an owner depending on the age of the building. I'm presuming it's probably not a, a very old building. So, um, you know, a lot of the pr pressures at the moment are on how do we deal with the, the, you know, the contractor and how do we get some form of action and hold accountability and, and recovery. Okay, thank you. Um, and a couple of people in the chat have asked about revised standards for remediation to comply with and what, what are they? Sorry. Um, sorry, what was the question again, Nikki? I just... are there, in a few instances, we've been asked, um, are there revised standards for remediation to comply with? And if so, what are these? And then um, one of the questions George has gone on to say on top of that, I'm referring to the type of cladding that will meet the, stand, the revised standards. Uh, we had a building clad with AC, ACP up to 13% of the external area in Melbourne. Has the VBA or CSV issued acceptable replacement materials that will comply with any revised standards? Right. Um, so the standards, um, in terms of Australian standards on regulatory, nothing's really changed in that sense. Um, what's acceptable um, to the, or the other point I will make, the Cladding Safety Victoria are not a regulator, they're merely a, a means of um, facilitating the remediation process. So a lot of that sits in the VBA as the regulators. Um, there's products that are, there's quite a number of products now that have um, been um, promoted, I guess, as an acceptable um, remedial solution, particularly for aluminium composite panel. The bulk of those products are solid aluminium. Um, so when you talk about solid aluminium, it, it's pretty straightforward, I guess, in that it doesn't have a core like the ACP <coughs> does. Therefore, um, it is a non-combustible material and irrespective of the manufacturer of that material, they all comply in a similar way. Um, the other product for expanded polystyrene is the Hebel product. So Hebel has been around for quite some time and um, there's a few different systems there, but generally speaking, that's a non-combustible solution as well. Um, so that's uh, in terms of changes, um, as I said, there hasn't been really been much of a change. Um, in terms of contracting and accountability and subcontracting, there's a few little changes in the act that, that, that have occurred there, but generally um, speaking, um, if a principal contractor is engaged, uh, this is from a, um, an owner's corporation point of view, if a principal contractor is engaged to do a remediation project, you'll have recovery against that principal contractor all the way along. Um, that's probably one of the most important aspects of it. Um, but certainly the products, um, there are um, solutions out there at the moment that are getting used regularly. So I think for any owners, you can certainly go in with a degree of confidence that if you're selecting one of those products, you're not going to end up um, in a similar situation again, because they are, um, most of them have been um, tested well and truly over the last couple of years since they've been used. So there's certainly a lot of um, precedents being set now and some comfort in going forward that um, those products um, are, yeah, I agree, getting used in the Cladding Safety Victoria scheme. So um, certainly there's some confidence level there that um, that's the way forward. Okay, and we've just received a comment from Brian saying the role of the Building Appeals Board in assessing and approving alternate solutions to total removal of combustible cladding needs to be made known. Yep, that's correct. Um, there, is, um, there is that option there, um, and we've seen a, a, a few buildings go down that pathway through the BAB to 
to have a look at, um, you know, the consideration of, of leaving portions of cladding on a building. Um, I have to say the success rate hasn't been, um, it hasn't been fantastic. Um, there are some buildings that are still sitting with the Building Appeals Board. There are other buildings that ultimately were withdrawn from that process and went down just a full replacement option. I guess the considerations there, um, I think for anyone is, the time and um, if you do choose to go down that pathway you do have to consider that there will be a time lag and it, it's not a quick process and there's a lot of consideration and there's a lot of um, evidence um, that needs to be gathered along the way report particularly fire reports on on the risk um, and then that gets considered so but agreed it is it is an option for owners if you wish to go down that pathway you can go down that pathway um, the only thing I will point out but um, is if you do have success down that pathway and for argument's sake um, there is a portion of cladding that you do um, you know you manage to keep on your building and you can mitigate the risk in other means such as sprinklers or, or, or um, as many different ways you can reduce risk. Um, you do have to be mindful of the fact that insurers don't necessarily look at it the same way. And just because um, something's passed through the Building Appeals Board and been approved and you still might get a permit, doesn't mean to say that the insurers may not look at that and consider that there's still a risk to them because, for instance, there might still be ACP on your building. Hence, the, the policy, um, either the premium or the excess may not change. It may still sit um, at, a, at a higher rate um, because of that. Um, and that's something we have seen. And it becomes as a, probably a little bit of disappointment, I guess, to owners sometimes in that they were hoping that that premium might reduce back down to something that reflects a non-combustible building. Um, it doesn't always happen that way. So if it is something you're doing, it's something you, you probably need to talk to your insurers about. Um, and then whatever that cost may end up in your premium, that needs to be blended with the general running costs of your building. So you, you, you know that that's ultimately where you're going to be moving forward. Okay, thanks, Bruce. And just you mentioned sprinklers there. We did have another question come in from Nick, who's in the same building as Lorelei, um, saying our building was deemed moderate risk, but we have an order by the council, but only has ACP on the balconies on two sides of the 65 storey building and the ground floor facade. Would extending the sprinkler system on the balcony lower the risk assessment by, inspect by inspectors in your experience? Uh, in my experience, I haven't seen cladding um, remain on a balcony or, or um, being accepted as a solution. Uh, it's just from my experience. I can't say whether that, um, you know, you, you may be able to convince if a sprinkler was put there that that could be left. But certainly, um, again, from experience, um, installing a sprinkler on a balcony, uh, whether there's um, whether there's water um, or, or hydrant access already there to, to allow that to be installed versus removing the cladding and, and putting a non-combustible product there. It's, it's a cost um, consideration, I guess. And um, getting back to replacing the cladding on balconies, um, particularly on a building of that size, um, a lot of people may not be aware that um, a lot of the replacement work that has been going on, particularly in the last six months, has been done via abseiling off buildings and also swing stages and things like that. What they are, that means it's not a full scaffold, which is a significant um, cost reduction in the replacement of the cladding on the building. Um, we've got one building at the moment that's very active, um, being re fully replaced uh, from abseiling. That technology to, to use abseiling to replace cladding has um, significantly improved in the last sort of five years or so where um, there's a lot of skilled labour that do it um, in that method and it's qu a quite an, a, uh, safe to do it that way if it's set up the correct way as opposed to putting a full scaffold up where you've got a million components that go to that scaffold and the, the, the risk of dropping things is, is still there either way you do it. So, um, so it is, um, I guess, um, just putting it out there that that, um, that is something that cost can be obtained from to get a better perspective as to how that could be done. Mm. Excellent, great. Um, okay, David's put a comment up to say, further to Martin's question above, we too manage a building that's high risk. It's high rise residential. We engage CSIRO to provide a report on the cladding which came back as combustible. We've obtained costings and fire engineer reports. We've provided this to the VBA and CSV. The VBA conducted their inspection. We've not heard anything from the VBA 
CSV or counsel despite repeated follow-ups? How long are CSV taking to process these? Should the OC just proceed with the required rectification works? Yeah, tough question. Um, I, I can't really comment on, um, I guess, CSV and how quickly they respond. Um, I, all I could say is if, if the building is not part of the scheme initially, like if it wasn't um, accepted in the scheme, then it, it may not be um, as high a priority as I guess some of the other buildings. Um, the buildings that are in the scheme vary significantly in scale and size and all the rest of it. So I think um, certainly, yes, um, you should be still proceeding with a resolution. Um, what that may look like, I don't know, without knowing the building a little bit more, but certainly um, I would be moving forward based on any notice you may have on the building, um, because that's the critical thing. Um, you've got to address that notice because that will escalate um, and it will, um, the very, very, very worst case scenario on that notice is, is reaching a point at the end of the, the line where it turns into a, uh, an evacuation order or something like that in the worst case. Um, and that's where you really want to um, be just sort of doing something along the way. Um, depending on what happens along the way and whether it's accepted in a CSV scheme or not, or, or whether you're going to get recovery off a builder or how things are going to go, um, a lot of re those recovery costs can be retrospective. So I think taking action doesn't necessarily mean you're going to block every other avenue to go backwards and recover if, if the tides turn later on. So um, certainly there's no downside to continuing on. Okay, thank you so much. I think that's probably about all that we've got time to address today. So thank you so much, George and Bruce, for providing all of that information. Hopefully it, um, it's provided some assistance to those um, buildings out there that are grappling with this issue at the moment, both defects mm -hmm. and also the cladding issue and what's happening in the state of Victoria. So I just, um, yeah, just like to say um, thank you very much to everyone who, who joined us and jumped into the session today. It was really great to see questions coming through uh, via chat because we've had quite a few. We do have a few that we didn't have time to address so are you fine for me to send those through George and Bruce and maybe we could get some responses back yep. to um, yeah, not a yeah, problem to okay that's excellent thank you thank you so much is there anything else you'd like to mention at this stage that we haven't covered or are you quite happy with the information that's been presented today no oh, from my right. perspective I'm happy um if any as I said if anyone's got any questions and I can see that there's quite a few that have come through we'll do our best to work through those and provide some response and um yeah that's that, that's hopefully it might provide some um, oversight, I guess, to people as to where, where the industry is up to today in Victoria. Yeah. yeah. I think from um, my perspective in, in terms of what we've, uh, we've dealt with with uh, Australian managers and lot owners is that, as I said before, it's, it's understanding and recognising the complexities, um, but there is relief out there. there. There are pathways that we can consider and uh, whilst uh, it, it, it appears to demanding um, and, and complex that, um, yeah, there's hopefully um, pathways that the, the stratas can undertake. Excellent, thank you. Thank you for highlighting some of those solutions and some of those pathways to our, to our audience today. So we'll send this recording out later today. Please share it, as we mentioned, if there's anyone else in your building that is having um, problems with this issue or they're trying to deal with it, they're not sure where to go. Um, and also, also include the link to the scope of works um, video that we've mentioned uh, and also contact details for George and Bruce so you can get in, in touch with them if you have any more questions. But thank you so much for your time. The hour went really fast, so yeah, it was great. <laughs> Really great information and uh, we hope to see you again at a session in the future wonderful thanks nikki good morning everyone thank you, thank you. thanks so much bye for now bye. thanks for joining us for this educational session if you gain value from the information please like this video you can also engage further with lookup strata by subscribing to our youtube channel or by being kept informed about strata news via our regular newsletters our subscribe link is listed in the description box below